So we're very pleased this evening to have as our special guest Donald Trump. Um, as you all know, I usually go through elaborate introductions because I memorize them and figure I should basically show everybody that I've actually done the research. Uh, in this case, I don't really know that uh, he needs as great an introduction as some of the uh, guests that I have given introduction to. I think it's fair to say he's one of the best known business developers, businessmen, real estate developers, entrepreneurs, celebrities, TV hosts, golf promoters and developers, and all around well-known uh, person in the United States. And um, I thought uh, that it would be very interesting for everybody to hear from Donald Trump. So I wanted to thank you, Donald, for coming this evening. Well, it's my honor. Thank you very much. Great honor. So let me start by asking you this. And it's rumored that you are thinking of going to Iowa soon to maybe do some exploratory work. And I, my question is, why would you consider a job that has a smaller home and an older plane than you currently have? Why That's would a you very tough question and a very good question. Well, first of all, David called me. He said, would you do this? When David calls, I say yes. When other people call, maybe <laughs> well, not so much. You. But it's a great honor to be here tonight, I must say. And it's an amazing group. So many friends. One of them is David Bossi, who right now is uh, heading up that dinner and, he, uh, and that whole weekend. And he said, in Iowa. Uh, in Iowa. And he said, would you do it? And I have great respect for David and what he's done and what he represents. And so I agreed to do it. And it's going to be a great event. Like, this is your biggest sellout crowd. I think we're going to have the biggest sellout crowd that they've ever had in Iowa, too, from what I'm understanding. So uh, I look forward to that. But I'm actually also going the night before. There's a real estate dinner in Iowa right. uh, done by a very, very big company and a terrific company. And they asked me to be the keynote speaker. So I'm there for two reasons, real estate and politics. OK. So but um, let me finish that up. Are you considering maybe getting into politics as a candidate or running for president, or you're not sure yet? Well, you know, I've been building buildings all my life. We've done, you know, done a great job, as you understand. And, uh, and one thing about David, if he didn't think we did a good job, I wouldn't be here tonight. That I can tell you. But we've done a good job, and I am considering it very strongly. Uh, a lot of people think that I have fun with it, that I'm playing games, that I enjoy the process. And I do enjoy the process to a certain extent. But the country's in serious, serious trouble. We just, as you know, we just broke $18 trillion in debt, largely to different places like China and others. And we just are in very, very serious trouble. So I am considering it very strongly. Wow. So when do you think you might make a decision? Sometime after the beginning of the year, probably sometime in March, April, or May. Okay. So um, you wouldn't start below the top job. The president's the top job. You wouldn't start a little bit lower, no? Governor or something, just to get a little experience well, in the governor? You know, I've dealt in politics all my life. All of my life I've been in politics, and usually as a supporter on the other side, right. and I support a lot of different people and people that I think are going to be good. I'm a Republican, but I'll support people that I really think are going to be good. And frankly, I just think we need something uh, very good, very fast, or we're going to be in very big trouble as a country. And a lot of it's common sense. For instance, the torture report. Do we have to announce the torture report? Which, by the way, cost $40 million to do. I'm trying to figure out how does this report cost $40 million. They paid these couple of guys $40 million. They paid $80 million to come up with the process. And there's so much, there's so many things that I see in this country, whether it's common sense or whatever. And I have, I have a big voice. I have, you know, millions and millions of followers on Twitter and Facebook. And when I say something, people, some people don't like it, but most people do like it. And whether it's uh, jobs, and the thing I like best, and I think the thing that I'm best at, is the economy and how to put people to work. Right. And that's what we need in this country. All right. The campaign is typically a two-year process. Right. And then um, you, if you're elected president, you have to spend four or eight years at it, right in the peak of your earning period. You would say that's OK? Well, I have a, a great company with tremendously talented people. I have some of those people sitting right here at the table, some of my executives. But I also have children. I have three of my five children are in the company, Don, Eric, and Ivanka. And uh, they've done a, a fantastic job. And four years ago, I was leading in the polls. I was beating everybody in the polls. And what happened is I just really was loving what I do. I love what I do. I would rather do what I'm doing than run for president. But I also love the country more. And I just think that uh, unless I see somebody that's outstanding, I would 
very much be inclined to do it. Okay. All right. Well, I don't think you can make any more news than you just made. So. Uh, <laughs> All right. Let's go home, folks. All right. So let's start back at the beginning, if we could. All right. Your father was a pretty prominent uh, real estate developer in uh, not in Manhattan, but in, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn and Queens. Queens. Yes. So um, as a young boy, you would say you were aggressive, maybe, and you were sent to a military academy? I was. I was sent to military academy. Uh, my father said, you know, you need a little discipline. You're sort of tough to handle. And they sent me up to a military academy, New York Military Academy, where we had some really tough people working up there. And, you know, I, I was supposed to be a very smart person, but I was on the aggressive side. And uh, they were terrific. These were drill sergeants. We had one uh, major device, used to be Sergeant Tobias at the time. He got promoted over the years to major, and now he's actually a colonel, and he's very old, but he's a great guy. And he was tough. And you didn't talk back to him. Today, you couldn't do this, OK? This right. was a different world. But you just didn't talk back to this guy, or it was bad, bad trouble. And I mean, today, they call it harassment. It would be the biggest front page of every newspaper. Right. But it was. Uh, it was a good place, and it was a tough place. And I ended up graduating at the highest rank, so I acclimated. You know, you have to acclimate. You have a, a climate. And it wasn't my climate, but by the time I was there five years, and by the time I finished, I graduated at the highest rank. Right. And I learned a lot about leadership, and I learned a lot about a lot of things. And so you were an athlete. You, you were a captain of the baseball team. And I was, Did yes. you ever think about being a professional baseball player? Well, I always uh, was somebody that loves sports, and I always did well at sports. And I love baseball in particular. I was on the football team, and I was on the wrestling team. Not a great wrestler. Uh, not a great basketball player. I had bad jumping ability. I just was not able to get up there. But I was a very good baseball player. And uh, I, I guess I always did think. You know, right. I was recruited, and they all wanted me to go in Major League. And I was a little different. Today, those days, you'd make $3. You didn't, there was no money, no anything. And ultimately, uh, my father had a, a business in Brooklyn, mostly in Brooklyn, New York, and as a real estate developer. And ultimately, I did that for a lot of the right reasons, and it became a lot of fun. I wanted to make it more exciting, and you know, I always loved show business, right. and I loved other things, but I think we put some show business into the real estate well, business. Well, you went to Wharton after New York Military Academy, right. and you did pretty well there, majored in real estate or right. specialized? Right, well, I majored in finance. And I liked finance, uh, but I, I, did, uh, I did well, and I loved the Wharton School of Finance. I always thought it was a great school. But I read that at one point you thought about going into the film business. True. And what took you away from that? Well, it's in sort of an interesting story, but uh, I went to, uh, I actually applied to USC, where they had a great school of cinema. They said that was like the Wharton School of Cinema. And I applied, and what happened was a little interesting. There was a man who was having troubles in real estate. And he came to me, smart guy, and he said, could you help me? And I gave him, and I was only 19 years old, and I gave him a lot of advice. And this guy was a top Broadway producer. And I said, you know, I'd love to go to USC and all this stuff. I kept talking about movies. And he said, you know, I tell you what, you just saved my life. You really know real estate. You got to be crazy to go into show business. And it really affected me. And I went in with my father, and I was uh, in Brooklyn for five years, my first five years went into the business with my father, did some really, really good deals for him. He was very, very happy with me. And he was a tough guy. He was very tough and had a great heart. He was a, a good man, but he was a tough man. And he would never let anybody sign checks, as an example. Under any, so he had to sign every check. You know, today they sign them by computer. I don't know about your company, I'm sure your company. But today you press right. a button and everybody gets paid. There's no negotiation, whatever it is. If it's a mistake, they never right. find it. He would sign every single check and he'd look and he'd study it, and oh, and he'd call the people, you're getting too much money. You shouldn't be getting This is a little different than we have today. So uh, I, I actually continued that practice. I signed many, many, many what? checks. You know, the company's gotten so big, it's hard. But I like signing checks, because I see what's going on much better by doing that. Right. So what was it like? You go to your father, who you know was a tough guy to work for, and you said, Dad, I want to go on my own. What did he say? He. Um, he really respected it, you know, he, as being in Brooklyn and Queens, and we'd look across the river, the East River, and I'd see those big, tall buildings. I'd say, Pop, that's what I want to do. I want to build those buildings. I want to be there. I love it. I got to be there. And he sort of said, that's not our territory. You know, like a lot of fathers would say. He said, you don't know anything about that, and that's not our territory. Let's stay in Brooklyn. 
And you know, my father started up building one-family homes and then apartments for mostly middle-income apartments, almost all middle-income and some low-income using federal subsidies, the uh, 236 program, uh, a lot of different programs. Uh, Section 8, we had a Section 8 program, which was amazing. They gave you the money for nothing. I mean, it was actually a pretty good program for the developer. But it also allowed people to live at a very low rent. And my father did a lot of that, and I did it with him. And we did it well. But I said, you know, Pop, I want to go in. And I started with the Grand Hyatt Hotel. I took an option. Right. And I converted that to the Grand. It, the, it, it was originally the old Commodore Hotel. Sort of interesting how my life progresses, where we go from that to the right. OPO. But, but make sure everybody understands, you were about 29 years old, or something like that, 28, yeah. 29. And you bought an old hotel that was near the Grand Central Station called the Commodore. Correct. And you put in no money. Is that I right? put in almost no money, Almost yes. no money. So how did you manage to do that with no money? Well, it was owned by the Penn Central Railroad, and it was run by some very good people. Uh, actually, it's very interesting, because he happens to be a very good man. It was Victor Palmieri and company, and one of the people is John Koskinen. Does anyone know John Koskinen? He's the head of the IRS, oh, nice. and he's a very good man. And while I am a strong conservative and a strong Republican, He's a friend of mine, and he did a great job running Victor Palmieri. And I made deals with John and the people at Victor Palmieri and took options to the building. And after I took options to the Commodore, I then went to the city, because the city was really in deep trouble. I was about 28 years old, and the city was really in trouble. And I said, look, you're going to have to give me tax abatement. Otherwise, this thing's never going to happen. Then I went to Hyatt. I said, you guys put up all the money, and I'll try and get the approvals. And I got all the approvals. And Hyatt, Jay Pritzker, and the Pritzker family, they put up the money. And we built a hotel. We were 50-50 partners, and it became very, very successful. Then I did the convention center and lots of other jobs. Okay. So let's talk about one of the other very famous buildings you did, uh, Trump Tower. Right. How did you get the right to build that piece of land, and how did you finance that? Well, that was uh, owned by a company named Conseco, and uh, originally Genesco. And I guess you know Genesco. It was from Nashville, Tennessee. And Genesco was run by a father and son, it was a public company, and they were fighting like cats and dogs, unlike your children and my children so far. We want to keep it that way, by the way. But they were fighting like cats and dogs. And I was reading about it, because I love reading the financial papers. And at those times, it was exclusively papers. Today, it's a little bit papers and lots of other things. And I saw the trouble that they were having, that Genesco was in deep trouble. And I knew they owned Bond with Teller Department Store. So I called the head of Genesco, and I went to Nashville, Tennessee, where I have a warm spot in my heart for Nashville, because I made an amazing deal there. I took an option to buy the site. And what happened is, as soon as that option was announced, every developer in the world went there trying to buy. Because even then, it was the best site. You know, 57th and 5th next to Tiffany is the best site. But it was too late, because I already had it signed. And they tried to get out of it, because obviously, they saw it was much more valuable than what I paid. And then I ultimately dealt with a great man named Walter Hoving, who was the head of Tiffany. And he took Tiffany to great levels. He took Tiffany from trouble to great levels. And I bought the air rights over Tiffany, and I bought the air rights over another place, and a few more air rights. And I ended up with a 68-story building that turned out to be a tremendous success, as you know, right. right from the beginning, called Trump Tower. And I guess one of the little, when I bought the air rights from Tiffany, I had the right to call it Tiffany Tower. And I went to a friend of mine, a very uh, streetwise guy, Dennis Stein. And I said, Dennis, I have the right to call it Tiffany Tower, but I want to call it Trump Tower. What would you do? He said, when you change your name to Tiffany, call it Tiffany Tower. Uh, uh, so I called it Trump Tower. Even though I had this incredible right, David, I had this incredible right to use the name Tiffany, but I called it Trump Tower, and it was one of the better things I've done. Your, if your name had been Rubenstein, you think it would have worked as well? Rubenstein Tower? I, 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 I think it might have worked very well. well. You know, hey, so you, you, Michael Bloomberg's done very well, right? But you came up with the idea of putting your name on things and actually making a brand of it. And when did you actually realize that by putting your name on something, you could actually get maybe a higher price for it? Well, a lot of people think it was, they wrote a big article recently, like I had this brilliant strategy of naming. And you know, I, honestly, it was sort of like, just happened. It started with Trump Tower. I did the Grand Hyatt Hotel first in Manhattan. Right. That was my first job. I did the convention center, Jacob Javits Convention Center. Took options to the land, got the state to build right. on it, and did well with it. And they built the Jacob Javits Convention Center. But you know, nobody knew that much about me. And then when I did Trump Tower, because I mean, I never thought at a young age, like 30, I would have the best piece of land in the world. It you know it never changes. I mean, that piece of land was the best then, and it's the best now. We signed a lease with Gucci. 
that's one of the great retail leases ever signed, as you understand. And so I, I never really knew. And then when I called it Trump Tower, a lot of things happened because of the prominence of the location, the success of the building. I was able to get it zoned. And a lot of people said, you'll never be able to get it zoned. You'll never build a tall building. You'll never be allowed to build an all glass, beautiful, monolithic building. Ada Louise Huxtable of the New York Times, the critic, the architectural critic, she gave it phenomenal reviews, just phenomenal. And then later on, Herbert Mushamp of the New York Times gave it phenomenal reviews. And what I did is I just, it just morphed into other things. And then I ended up doing a book, The Art of the Deal, right. and that became on, such a great on thing. On that building, though, you live at the top, I do, tri top three floors. Yes. Right? You, now, a lot of uh, wealthy uh, people are being sought after to buy buildings in New York, apartment buildings. You think all these, are there enough billionaires to fill all these big buildings and being built in New York? No, I don't think they'll fill them. And That's your second big story tonight. All right. I so don't like, think you're going to fill them. No, there are too many being built. 432 Park Avenue, you've seen this one, it's like 90 well, stories. Well, and something. they're friends of mine doing it. And, and don't forget, they have the advantage that it was early, early on. And uh, they're very good people. And I think, I think that it's going to do OK because it's early. Right. But the ones coming online, I mean, there's so many of them. I look at the plans. I study real estate. I know every inch of Manhattan. I mean, I know which store is available five years before the lease comes due. And uh, I look at all of the plans for Manhattan, and I just don't see any way. I mean, Rush has been taken out of it right. over the last year, you know, as you know. Rush is gone, and a lot of the Russians that were buying these apartments are no longer buying apartments, and they've got bigger problems. And frankly, uh, you know, I just don't see any way they're going to do it. Now, that's an opportunity for you, and it's an opportunity right. for me. A man came to my office. I won't use his name, but he's a very well-known, very big developer. He has a site to build a 100-story building on the site. And I don't love the site, but it's good. Not great, but it's good. You know, the great always works. The good doesn't always work, OK, in real estate. And uh, he has a 90-story building, a 100-story building. You could do sort of whatever you want. And he wanted to sell it to me. And you know, I've been through uh, great, great times. But I've also had to fight like crazy to keep everything going. And I said, you know, you do it, because I don't have the guts anymore to do it. And he said, I promise I won't tell anybody you said that. Though. Nobody's going to. But it's true. I, I see uh, the market is, I think, will be oversaturated. Well, let me ask you, when you were having this success, you're building Trump Tower, you're doing other things, um, you bought an airline, uh, uh, the shuttle, and then you got involved in, in gaming and right. lost uh, in, uh, I guess, in Atlantic City. Atlantic City. And then the economy collapsed, and many people thought you were not going to be able to survive. How did you manage to hoping. get... Well, I, well, I just want to continue to live my lifestyle. I like, you know, planes and everything else. Then those days I wasn't married, so I like planes and beautiful women. I like my lifestyle. I didn't want to lose my lifestyle. So how did you, so how did you get okay, through all so, that? So, well, first of all, uh, the shuttle was great because what happened with the shuttle was this was like 57th and 5th. That was the shuttle going to Washington or Boston. In the airline business, that was sort of like the best asset. So I had that. So the banks came, the market had totally crashed, but the banks came to me and people came to me and I made a deal where it was a great deal to sell the shuttle, even in bad times. Uh, I bought the Plaza Hotel. I made an unbelievable deal in selling the Plaza Hotel because it was so, if that hotel, and I've always said it, if that hotel was one block in any direction, I would have died with it. But because it was the Plaza, I made an unbelievable deal in uh, getting out of the Plaza, and I, it just worked out really well. And other things I did were, I, you know, I was telling, actually, David and I were speaking before, and I said, you know, the crazy thing about Atlantic City, I was there during the boom time when it was a monopoly and did phenomenally in Atlantic City. But then Atlantic City changed. A lot of bad decisions. They built a convention center. I fought like hell that they wouldn't do this. They built the convention center in the wrong location. They didn't do the airport properly. Uh, the politicians took over Atlantic City and absolutely destroyed it. But Atlantic City, for me, has been a great experience. And I got out seven years ago and uh, again, made a lot of money. But I do play the bankruptcy laws, not individually, but corporately. And other people do, too. Many of your friends that we were talking about before. You know, you look at Caesars is going to go bankrupt. And everyone, every time they play the bankruptcy laws, no, it's just like a standard little story. When I play, I buy a building. The building is in turmoil. It's got a big mortgage. The bank is being vicious and ruthless. I buy the building, I call up the bank, they're not nice, so I throw it into a chapter, I beat the hell out of them, and then I get huge reductions, and then I make a lot of money in the building. But when I buy the building, they say, Trump files for bankruptcy. I didn't file for bankruptcy, I use it as a tool. And the enemies, you know, I call them the losers and haters, I call that on Twitter, I call them the losers and the haters. They say, oh, Trump went bankrupt. 
I use that as a business tool. You understand, and so do many of your friends. You look at who, whether it's Sam Zell, right. whether it's Leon Black, whether it's Carl Icahn with TWA. Right. We use the different ones. The only thing is that with me, uh, they always say, every time I do it to my advantage, they say, Trump went bankrupt. If David does it, nobody's going to say that. So that makes you smarter than me. I doubt that. But let me ask you about He, he wants to get I, off I, this subject. I doubt that. Well, but, he doesn't but, like but, this But you subject. have been asked a number of times in interviews I've read, uh, you filed for bankruptcy. And you point out yeah. you've never filed for bankruptcy. I've never, been, well, I've never. never gone bankrupt. Okay. Yeah. No, so one of the deals you did that got a lot of attention, um, I would say you stole the property, but legally, you bought Mar-a-Lago right. for about $8 million, more or less. That's right. And today it's probably worth... Hundred million or more, two hundred million—I don't know. But how did you come up to buy that when it was, you know, pretty cheap? Then? Well, that was an interesting deal because you know, from Florida, that's one of the great pieces of land and one of the great—it's the greatest house in America, I would say—and turned it into the Mar-a-Lago Club, which is very successful. But at the time, this was in 1986. I went there, and it was for sale for 38 million dollars. And I said, I don't want to pay. That was a lot of money. In 19, you know, 86, $38 million. That's like $300 million today. So they won $38 million. So I said, you know what? But stupidly, the Marjorie Merriweather the Post Foundation, the children were not smart like she was. When she died, they sold the beach. And they sold the beach to a friend of mine. And the friend of mine was a great guy. He, he founded Kentucky Fried Chicken. He founded a couple of different Hospital Corporation of America. Massey. Massey. And he was, unfortunately, very sick. He had cancer. And I went to him, and I said, would you do me a favor? Could I buy the beach? Now, this is the beach in front of Mar-a-Lago. Mar-a-Lago's on 22 acres. It's this massive house. And they sold the beach for $2 million, or a million and a half dollars. And he said, you know, Donald, you're a friend of mine. I will sell you the beach. And I overpaid for it. You know, I paid $2 million for the beach. But that was the whole beach in front of Mar-a-Lago. And then I announced I'm going to build the ugliest building ever. It was going to be just a long, to take all the views, because I didn't want anyone to buy Mar-a-Lago. Right. It was embarrassing. I put this thing with no windows, no nothing, right. just a wall, so you couldn't see the ocean. In fact, the town almost got sick. They wanted to change the zoning. They want, But I did it for a reason. And then people, uh, Ross Perot, Al Taubman, many, many people wanted to buy Mar-a-Lago. But they said, we have to have the beach. So people came, and they offered me a fortune for the beach. I said, no, no, no. And then I forgot about it. And then a couple of years later, I got a call. And they said, we'd like to sell you Mar-a-Lago. And I almost said, like, what's Mar-a-Lago? You know, you tend to right. forget. We go on to the next one, right? On to the next victim. And I said, what's your price? And they said, we want $8 million. Now, they want it in the 30s. Right. And now they want, because they couldn't sell it without the beach. Because stupidly, they, I didn't get along with them, actually. I didn't get along with Dina Merrill at all. Um, because she was upset that I bought it. I said, why don't you buy it? You know, she was the daughter of the great Marjorie Merriweather Post, who was married, as you know, to E.F. Hutton, one of the great financiers. So when she opposed everything I did in Palm Beach, I became, I actually said a statement which never is very good for a relationship. I said, she was born, you know, Marjorie Merriweather Post was a great beauty, a magnificently beautiful woman on top of being smart. I said, she was born with the mother's beauty, but not the mother's brain. This was not a good quote right. on the front page of the Palm Beach Post in terms of long-term relationship, right? right. But she, she could have bought it, and she chose not to. And she was in charge of the foundation. They sold it. Anyway, I turned it into a club. So I got it for $8 million. They said, in fact, this is something. You know, David negotiates. If you say a company's worth a billion dollars, he's going to say, well, I'll give you $500 million. When they said $8 million, I didn't negotiate. You'll be ashamed right. of me. I said, I'll take it. It's the first time right. that's ever happened to me. I'd said, I because I, I was afraid they'd change it. So I bought it for $8 million, plus $2 million for the beach. And I turned it into a club, and it's, it's an amazing club. But and, you, and uh, after successful. you bought it, you realized later that the flight pattern was over. Right. And you sued Palm Beach or somebody. Correct. And in return for that, they gave you... Tremendous amounts of land in West Palm Beach. So drop the lawsuit. They gave you... And then what did you do with the land? I made the land into a great club, Trump International Golf Club, which is... Uh, now about 15 years old, which has become one of the most successful clubs. Is that how you got into golf? Was that your first golf? Uh, actually, I bought one in foreclosure. I love foreclosures, especially when it's somebody else. <laughs> Always better when it's somebody else's yeah. foreclosure. But um, I bought a, a big, beautiful piece of land in Westchester in foreclosure. Okay. And I said, what am I going to do with it? I made it into a golf club, and it became very successful. I bought uh, this one out of foreclosure, okay. you know, out of, uh, out of what I did. 
And I ended up with a tremendous lawsuit, had a good lawyer, uh, uh, and they ended up settling the lawsuit by making me a deal to buy 500 acres at a very good price of land in Palm Beach. And I turned it into a club, and it's become such a hot club. And now Mar-a-Lago and that club, they're sort of like sisters, and they do tremendously together the way they play off each other. So, And yeah, you've, you've been there, so I you know have. what I mean. It's a great place. The food's great. Service is great. Good. Hospitality's great. You always oh, go around and say hello to people. Good. I'm glad. I was worried it's you true. might say so. It's true. All right, so let me ask you this. You um, now own a lot of golf courses. And some people say golf is going this way because people are playing less. So why is golf a good business and to have? Well, for me, it's been great because I've been buying them over the last 10 years since the Depression. You know, we had, I call it the Depression because it really has been for a lot of people, it's been very bad. And I've been buying them, for instance, in Loudoun County, 600 acres right on the Potomac River, right up the road, which is phenomenal. And uh, I bought that for a very good price. One of the gentlemen that I made the deal with is here, so I'm not going to talk too much about what a good deal it was, but they also made a good deal because they didn't know what the hell they were doing. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Where are you? <laughs> right? But, but, and they're great people. And, and we turned that into a tremendous success in right. Washington. We have, so, but what, what I do like is this. First of all, golf is doing very well internationally. Asia, China, all over the place, South America. Uh, they just approved it for the Olympics. You know, it's in the next Olympics. It's never been. And golf is doing really well if you have good places, if you have the good clubs. And, but what I really like also is the real estate. When I have 600 acres on the Potomac right. River, when I have 800 acres on the Pacific Ocean facing Catalina Island and, uh, you know, two and a half miles of frontage on the, in, you, in Los Angeles. Do you build in, homes around these? I, I do, but I don't even like, I, I hate to sell property. All right, but all right, now you play golf. Yes. And you are a handicapper of... Three or four. Three or four. Okay, well, that's pretty good. So you must play a couple rounds a week? At the Two beach. rounds, yeah. On I'd love to play more, but I just don't So have you ever played with Tiger Woods? Or? I play with everybody, and Tiger and Phil and everybody, and it's great. It's great to play with them, and that's when you realize you're not really a very good golfer uh, because they are tremendously talented people, amazingly talented. You know, it's a chain, right? Like you in business and a couple of the other folks in the room in business. You look at this little triangle, and it's that tip of that triangle, that's what you have. So they're tremendously talented people and really good people. One of the things I like about golf is that when I buy these courses, I'm buying tremendous amounts of land. So if I ever say, well, you know what, I'm going to close a golf course someplace. I'm going to own 700 or 600 or 800 acres on the Potomac River. It's pretty good stuff. Right. Or if I'm going to own 600 acres on the ocean, on the Pacific Ocean. I have... You know, it's a, a statement I always make. I never lost money on a lake, a river, or an ocean. I love that. In Scotland, I have, I just bought Turnberry, the great Turnberry, home of the British Open, which they call the Open Championship because it's probably the most important of the majors. And it's uh, just a great thing. And that's a 1,000 acres on the ocean. And you just don't lose money with that. And the clubs do very well. I don't want to close it. I don't want to sell any. But it's great real estate. The other one minor thing, too, I've made tremendous deals because of my relationship to golf. Uh, I play golf with people that love golf, and I become great friends with them. Uh, I, I have so many friends. Do I don't make, want to mention names. Do you make but deals I've, on the golf course? I make deals because of golf. Uh, I have so many wonderful friends, uh, people like Terry Lundgren, who's a fantastic guy. He's done an amazing job with Macy's. And you know he's a friend of mine. We play golf together. And, uh, and others, that I could never have the relationship with these people if I said, let's go out to dinner, or let's go out to lunch. I don't even think I'd have. I've made many, many deals. Actually, the Trump Tower site, um, which is one of, you know, one of the great real estate deals, I really started that by playing a round of golf with somebody that was very attuned to that whole situation in Nashville with Janeska. So um, you mentioned uh, Macy's. Now, if you go into Macy's, there's a Macy's not far from here and you want to buy some Donald Trump clothing, you can do so. I mean, do you pick the clothing? You design it? How does that work? I have people that are really good, and they come to me, and they show me, and I don't spend huge amounts of time because we have really people. Uh, you know, PVH is a fantastic company. They do much of it. Okay. Uh, and Macy's does a fantastic job. And we have ties, shirts, suits, cufflinks, all that stuff. And uh, they do fantastic. The tie so is one of the top-selling ties. This, this is, yeah, this is actually a Trump tie. Anybody want it? Okay. But it's, uh, I figured, in case that question, I had to wear it. All right. But you know, it's interesting. I used to spend a fortune.
buying, I, I didn't spend, I get them free because of The Apprentice, okay, so they give me ties, but still, $500 ties. If a little piece of water, Brioni, little piece of water gets on the tie, it's destroyed. These things are like steel, and they look better. So what can right, I do? Okay, so, well, let's talk so about- So much for my relationship right, with All right, Brioni. so you, you mentioned The Apprentice, so I was gonna go there. Okay. Um, how did that come about? Well, The Apprentice is interesting because, especially if you knew my father, you know, he was all business, and for him to even see, and he got to see just a little glimpse of it. But Mark Burnett, who did Survivor, and a great guy and a friend of mine, uh, but I didn't know him, and I have the Trump rink in, as you know, in Central Park, was formerly the Wolman rink. And I took it and fixed it and made it great, and I've had it for many, many years, and it's uh, the number one rink in the world for ice skating. And they wanted to do CBS, Les Moonvest, another great guy. They wanted to do a Survivor set live, so they built a jungle on the ice skating rink with the big buildings behind, and it was live, and it was great. And Mark Burnett called me, invited me. He said, Donald, would you do, I have a concept for a show, and I'll only do it if you do it. And I said, what's the show? He said, it's called The Apprentice, and basically you're doing this and that and ultimately firing people without using that word. But he said, ultimately, okay. you're getting rid of a person's show. And this was really the first of, a, of the kind, because it's been copied 15 different times. The Apprentice has been copied. And I'm very happy to say every single one of them has been a failure. Uh, you know all of right, the people right. that did them. I could go into the right. name. Anyway, so I said, let's take a look, and we did it. And I have an agent from William Morris, and a big agent, actually. And he said, it'll never work. Don't do it. You'll embarrass yourself. It'll be horrible, horrible. I said, I have a problem. I shook hands, and I shook hands with NBC. I shook hands with Mark Burnett. I have to do it. He said, don't do it. I demand this is, you're not, I'm not going to let you embarrass yourself. So I said, I have a problem. I'm, I actually happen to be, most people don't know, two things they don't know. It's my hair, which it really is. You know that. I think you know that. I hope you know that. And also, I'm an honorable person. Most people don't know that either. But I shook hands. <laughs> they assume I'm not. That's primarily because I'm in the real estate business in New York. But they assume I'm not. But I shook hands. I said, look, I can't, you know, I shook hands with the head of NBC, and I shook hands with Mark Burnett. I have to do it. He was very angry. Anyway, the show goes on. It started at 10. It went to eight. Now, 10 is massive. You know, you have hundreds of shows on. So everyone was shocked. And it was not supposed to do well. There was a critic in, I think, the Washington Post who said, to have a successful show, you have to have women as a preponderance of the audience. And what woman is going to want to watch Donald Trump? I was very insulted. I said, right. I've done so badly. So it went on at 10, right. All right. went to eight, went to five, went to three, and went to one. I had the number one show. In, in the world. I mean, I, I was the number one show in the country, the number one television show. And the agent called me up, and he said, Donald, could I see you? I said, about what, Jim? He said, well, your show just went to number one. Congratulations. It's a fantastic tribute, and I'd like to come over and say hello. What do you want? He said, I think I'm entitled to a commission. I said, how much do you think you're entitled to? He said, would $4 million be fair? I said, Jim, you're fired. And that's, just, that's the start. <laughs> But the, the, and, and by the way, now The Apprentice, it goes on again. I mean, this is now, it's 10 years, 14 seasons. I mean, it was so successful. And one thing about that business, it's sort of not like our business. Right. A lot of times, it takes on a deal, years and years but, for a deal. It, with that business, it's all about ratings. But, so but, we're going on on January 4th with a new season of The but Apprentice. But the phrasing, the phrase, um, you're fired, right. whose idea was that? Well, it was, that was my idea. The concept was we would let people go over a course right. of 16 right. weeks on television. And the first show, the first season, there was one guy, and he was a nice guy, but he was really pathetic. And I, so bad that I got angry at him. And I uh -huh. said, I won't use his name, but it's very easy to find out. I said, so-and-so, you're fired. And the whole place went crazy. The cameramen, were, everybody went crazy. And that's how that came about. It wasn't scripted. There's no script. We don't have any script at all. It's all, you know. So now, where do you, where do you shoot that? In, in New York? We or? shoot it in Trump Tower. Um, oh. We actually have a special boardroom that's made. And, you know, they all say, well, why don't you use your real boardroom? Because it's really a studio. Behind the ballroom, they have, uh, the boardroom, they have cameras all around the world. We have about 32, or at least 32 cameras in the boardroom during the shooting. So has anybody you've actually hired actually worked out OK? Or? I did. I hired a couple of guys, and they have. Bill Rancic did a great job. He was the first one. And uh, I've hired uh, Andrew Latinsky and uh, numerous people that were on the show. But when I was going to hire them, I would never, if I thought somebody was really great and I was going to hire them, I would never let them win because the price goes up. So I would always, <laughs> it's true, I would always, 
I would always make sure I fired them sometime prior to right. the end. So, but I've hired a number of them. So we're in the Washington area. Let's talk about two things you've done in the Washington area. First one, um, you bought out of bankruptcy, I guess, um, the Kluge estate. Yes. And, and you didn't pay that much for it. How no. did that come about? Well, it's in Charlottesville, Virginia. It's uh, 1,500 acres. It's phenomenal property. John Kluge was a friend of mine. I was much younger than him. Uh, but he and I always liked each other. And he used to go around saying, Donald Trump is a really smart guy. I don't want to brag. He used to say, Donald Trump is the smartest of the young people. And I used to like John Kluge, you know, Metro Media. And he married Patricia, and that marriage was a disaster. And he had this piece of property, and he gave it intelligently, gave it to her. And he said, you should build a winery with the money I gave. Well, she built the winery, and she spent so much money building. He wanted this to happen, and she went bust. And the bank took it over, and I bought it from the bank. And they had hundreds of millions of dollars in it, and I bought it for a very small price. And it's now the largest winery on the East Coast. It's now called Trump Wine and Champagne and everything. And uh, my son, Eric Trump, runs it, and it's become fantastic. It's, it's so beautiful, and people are getting married. We took some of the, he had a car collection where he had these massive buildings, and I turned them into ballrooms. And people are getting married there. It's right next to University of Virginia, right next to the home of Thomas Jefferson, right. touches the property. And it's a great area, really a beautiful area, and we're very proud of it. And the winery is beautiful. I mean, they built a magnificent winery. But they never, you know, sad. They never really got to right. use so, it. So now, closer to here, um, on Pennsylvania Avenue, you recently won the right to build a hotel out of what the, is the old post office building. That's um, right. How did you win that? When did you? How did you beat everybody? You paid the highest price, or? Well, I think we had the best concept, and I had one of the great financial statements. I mean, they want to make sure it gets built, and that's been going on. And I have to say, and I don't know if Dan Tagliarini is here. Somebody said he may be here. From the, is he here by any chance? Somebody said he was here. Head of um, GSA? He's the head of the GSA. I have to tell you that the GSA was so professional. Now, maybe if I didn't get it, I wouldn't say this, but I would say it anyway. Uh, the people in the GSA were so, I, I go around talking about it. You know, people in government, you have people in government, some of them are phenomenal people. I mean, they're phenomenal people, and these people were very professional. Now, this was a, a job, it was an RFP, request for proposal. And uh, it was really about concept, almost more importantly than price. They wanted to make sure a lot of jobs would be provided, a lot of, so some people had it as an office building, some people had it as a, it was a, the, the highest, the most sought after piece of property in the history of the GSA. And we put in a proposal, our architect is here, and we put up a, a fantastic proposal to do one of the great hotels of the world, because we had the location and we have the bones. Right. The, the building is magnificent, the exterior walls, and some people think it's their favorite building in Washington, and it's been a very controversial thing because, as you know, 30 years ago, they wanted to rip it down, and people were marching in the streets to stop it. Anyway, they chose us because of the fact that I was you know, able to easily get it done. We have a great statement, and because we have a great track record, and importantly, because the concept of the hotel puts more people to work than any other so concept. How many rooms will there be? We're going to have 300 rooms. We're going to have the largest luxury ballroom in the entire tri-state area. We're going to have, it's going to be a magnificent ballroom. We're going to have many meeting rooms, spas. Uh, it's really a, you know, it's a big project. We'll be spending over $200 million on the renovation. And, you know, I had a choice today. When I arrived, I arrived a couple of minutes early, and I said, you know, do I go over to the building? It's under demolition right now and massive. We have over 1,000 people working in the building. I said, do I go over to the building and get dusty, my shoes, everything dusty? Or do I sit around in a corner somewhere in the hotel here and wait for David and say, OK, Dave, I'm ready in two hours, right? right? right. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go to the hotel, because that's an entrepreneur. Yeah, we have to do it. We can't. So my shoes are a little dusty, but that's OK. Yeah. So is my suit, but these are minor details. But I'm very proud of it. It's going to be one of the great hotels. And you know, and I shouldn't say this, and uh, certainly we're in a very nice hotel, but uh, Washington doesn't have the great luxury hotel that it should have, and everybody knows that. And this will be one of the great hotels. The hotel I have in Chicago was rated the best hotel in North America by Condé Nast Traveler. I think that this hotel will be better. I think this will be one of the great hotels of the oh, world. And well, that's going to be ultimately a great thing for Washington. And that's why they chose us, the GSA. So will I have Trump on the outside? or Yes, but very, very uh, little. Oh, OK. 
So I was in Chicago the other day, and the Trump name was there very big, right? Well, that's a big, uh, that's a, well, that's a 90, that's a 94 story okay. building. But you know, that was very controversial because I got the approval to put it up. And when I put the letters up, Everybody went crazy. Actually, now they love it. But before the letters were up, when they heard 28 feet, and you know these are massive, these are letters as big as the ceiling, and it, right on the side of the river, right over the river. And so they said, well, you know, this is terrible. We're going to pass a law that nobody ever can do it again. Never can anybody do what Trump did again. And I said, I agree 100% with that law. <laughs> so, so, and they uh, just, oh, by the way, the law just passed it. I'm very happy about it. I agree. <laughs> So you've mentioned um, your children a minute, and let me talk about that. It's very difficult for a wealthy parent to raise children who want to go into their own business, let alone do it in a very sensible way. And how did you actually raise children that don't seem to be spoiled and don't seem to be uh, rebelling against their father? Well, you know, it's, it's such a great question, and, and somehow I hope I'll be here in 10 years saying the same thing with you, because you have great children, and uh, I know your daughter, and she's so amazing. And uh, you know, it's very complicated. I, I get that question so much because people see Ivanka and they see Don and, you know, they're just doing well. And from the time they were, and I tell this to everybody, from the time they were two years old, old enough to think and old enough to speak, I would say, listen, no drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. I don't want drugs. I, they didn't even know what it was. And I'd say it, and then they'd be 15, and I'd say, no drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. Because I've seen people like you, like me, very substantial people, where they have children, and they become alcoholics, they become drug addicts, they become other things. I mean, I add the cigarettes, because if you can stay away from cigarettes, it's good. I don't smoke. I have no intention of smoking. But I have people, they, friends of mine, they're very strong. They smoke. They can't stop. They can't stop drinking. I went to the Wharton School. I had a friend who hated this taste of scotch, hated it. But he tried to develop a taste for scotch. And I saw him recently, he's a total alcoholic. He developed a taste for scotch. And all he had to do was stay away from it. So I say, no drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. Because I've seen many, many people that are very smart and very successful that have children that are very, very smart, as smart as you're going to find. Children that can go to Harvard, Yale, Wharton, any of the schools, but they're addicted to drugs or alcohol. And again, I throw the cigarettes in for health. I also say no tattoos, by the way, but I, that seems to be failing if you look at television. I think the tattoo thing, I'm going to have to just stop. But um, I, I was always very strong on that because you're put at such a tremendous disadvantage as a child that you're never going to make it. You know how competitive it is, and you see it because you hire all these young geniuses. If somebody's a drinker, if somebody's on drugs, it's not going to work. And, and I just say, you just can't do that. So I tell all my friends, you got to just drum it into their heads, no matter what you do. So um, what would you like, not that you're going to slow down, but let's suppose you don't get to be president of the United States for a moment. Let's assume that. You know, the chance of getting elected is relatively small yeah, for anybody, I right? I agree. Right? So if you don't get to be president. I mean, president, I hate to admit it, but you know. All right, so I, if you don't get to be president, right. um, you're going to do this for another 20 years or so? Well, you know. Interesting about real estate, a little bit like that in your business, but not as much, uh, that everybody in real estate is old. They never retire. You ever notice? They don't ever retire. You see these guys are 89 years old. I'm going to fix. They really do it instead of plastic surgery. Right. It's true. Right. They fix a building. Like I can fix the old post office instead of getting right. a facelift, right. you know? Because I can make that post office so beautiful, and that's my baby, and that's me. But real estate people don't retire. And now, other businesses that retire, I have friends. You know, my father used to have an expression, to retire is to expire, which is a tough expression. But I've seen it. I, a banker, a big banker, a tremendously powerful banker, a friend of mine, uh, he had to retire at 65 a number of years ago. And he was a vibrant guy, a great guy. You would know him. A great guy and very powerful. He could, he could approve a $500 million mortgage or loan without even going to committee. That's not bad, OK? And he was forced to retire at 65. And I saw that man get old within a period of one year. It was like the most incredible thing. And I also saw him say to me, oh, well, when I retire, I have so many friends. I say, you have me as a friend, but you're not going to have a lot of people as a friend, because a lot of people aren't going to call you back. And they all call you back right now, but they're not going to call you back. And he came to me about three weeks ago. He said, you know, you're the only one that calls me back and talks to me and goes, at he said, all those other guys, New York developers mostly, I call them, they don't return my calls. They used to return my call before I made it. 
and they don't return my call. But that's life. I mean, that's a sad thing, but that's life. You're going to keep doing this, in other words, for quite a while. So I would. I love it. I love doing it. I mean, I love doing that more than right. running and getting abused by Chris Matthews. Hello. How are you? Mrs. Matthews is in the audience, and I love her husband, actually. He's, been, he's always been a friend, but boy, did he turn liberal over the last 10 years. It's incredible. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, he interviewed me years ago. He wasn't that way, but that's okay. So people ask, are obviously fascinated by your lifestyle and so forth, and uh, take your, your plane that has your name on it, and um, is that an advertising device by putting your name I on guess. It? It's a Boeing 757. It's a great plane, and it's, you know, you put it at the airports, and it stays, it can only go to the major airports, and you see it, and it's probably a form of branding that I don't okay. even think about. And, you know, I was going to say before that, it was a little bit by osmosis. It just came. I did Trump Tower, then I did another building. I did really well with it. I would get higher rents and higher numbers than other people. And all of a sudden, I started building these Trumps all over the place, and uh, the brand became very valuable. So people are often fascinated by your hair. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. That could be the hardest question of the evening. I mean, people um, just seem to be. Well, it is mine. It is. I mean, it's it's legitimately my hair. I get abused. I had a story recently. It was the best story, one of the best stories I've ever had. But in the second paragraph, he said, but he wears the worst hair piece of any human being I've ever had. And it's my hair. And so I can't even show the story in a way. You know, it's like an embarrassing story. But it was a good story, a financial story. Uh, no, it's my hair for some reason. And I've always combed it the same way, more or less. Right. And I do get abused uh, about the hair. But I've, I've actually become somewhat immune to it. You know, it's funny, when you know it's yours, if it wasn't mine, I think it would be harder. But when you know it's yours, it's okay. It may not be beautiful, it may not be pretty, right. but it is mine. So on the economy, what right. is your projection now of the economy? You think we're going to grow at about 3% or so? Or? Well, I, I think a lot of things are happening. You know, I love the fact that oil is dropping, but a lot of people don't. I mean, I've always said that oil should never be up at those levels. It was a fixed level. Uh, and it's interesting where I see that they say Saudi Arabia is purposely keeping the price down to destroy. They're not, look. You do business with Saudi Arabia, I know that, and a lot, and so do I. I have a lot of friends, and they buy a lot of real estate, a lot of apartments, and this and that, but, and they have space in buildings that I own. But uh, I don't really believe that. But there's a theory that they're keeping the price low to destroy all of these new people with fracking that are becoming, you know, that are coming out with oil. Who knows? Who knows what it is? I love low oil prices, but a lot of people are saying it's low not for that reason, it's low because there's no demand because China's weak, and because this one's weak, that one's weak, everyone thinks weak. Obviously, Russia is getting killed right now with so many things going on, and they're so strongly based with oil. So a lot of bad things could be happening. Look, the unemployment rate is not 5.8 or 5.3 or 6.7 or 7.9. Uh, the real rate's probably 20%, because people stop looking for jobs, and they consider them employed. You stop looking for a job. There are so many people out there that gave up looking for jobs, or they're part-time, or there's something else. But the fact is that I think your, your economy is obviously not doing so well. Now, the stock market is the one ray of hope. Right. So I've never been a stock market person. But about uh, three years ago, two and a half years ago, I bought a tremendous amount of stock. First time ever. I was never, you know, I never believed in letting other people run my money. And I, I see some of these guys making tremendous amounts of money to run some company that's frankly easy to run. And I always, I never liked it. And, but anyway, I bought stock. And the reason I bought stock, I said, because it's free money. You're getting free money. Interest rates are so low. And also, in my CDs, they were offering me one quarter of 1%. So I said, what do I have to lose? It's almost like right. ridiculous. So I bought a lot of stock. And the stocks have gone up tremendously. I feel like such a genius every day, up, up, up. And I sold my stocks a few months ago, everything. Because I'm not a great believer in the leadership of the country, and I'm not a great believer in decisions that are being made with respect to the country. And usually that would lead somebody that's, you know, intelligent to go and do okay. something. So I sold all of the stock that I bought. But I sort of, like, you know, I'm not a stock market guy, but I made, but the reason I did it was because the interest rates were so low. At some point, those rates are going to go very high, and that's going to be a pretty difficult time, I think, for the country. So would it be fair to say that you don't suffer from a lot of self-doubt? You seem to be very, you know, I mean, I, I always, I don't, you know, I'm more like Woody Allen. I don't really know, you know, what I should be doing. I'm not sure if I made a mistake here. You don't really have that issue so much? Well, I probably do have that issue. I mean, I, I think a lot about uh, different things. And, you know, uh, Alan Greenberg, who I know, Ace, you, Ace, you were friendly with Ace, and he was a great guy. 
And he used to buy stocks a little bit for me early in the process. And you know, when I did it in a very small way. And one time I, and I never heard this before, I bought a stock, it went up a lot, and I sold it. And a week later, somebody announced that it was going to be bought. And I would have made double the money if I would have right. kept it, right? I called it, Ace, we did the horrible thing. What did we do? I sold that stock. I should have kept it another week. I would have looked. He said, and it's the first time he ever got angry at me. He said, never, ever talk about a deal that's been made. Cross that deal off your head, because he's a trader. Right. He's a great trader, right? And he said, never, ever talk. Don't even think about it. And he said it with anger. And he's never been angry at me before. But it was sort of interesting. It was a lesson I learned. Um, no, I'm, I'm very happy. I sold the stocks. They've gone up a little bit since, but now they're sort of having some pretty bad times the last week or so. It'll be interesting to see what happens. So, but I, I like to run, I like to be invested in things that I run. I have confidence in myself, and I like to be invested in things that I run. I don't run these companies, right. and I see too many people that do that I know, and in your case, I have tremendous respect for this man. But in a lot of cases, I don't have great respect for the people running some of these companies. So let me ask you a final question. What is the most fun about being Donald Trump? I mean, what's the best part about being Donald Trump? And is there any downside to being Donald Trump? Well, I have to be very careful with that answer. I could get me into a lot of trouble. But I, I will say that, that I have had a good time in my life. I have a wonderful family. I have a wonderful wife. Uh, I have, uh, my children have been great. I, I, think the, the, I think the best part is that I just love what I do. I really enjoy what I do. I think the hardest part is the fact that I can't go anywhere. I used to, like in the real estate business, I could walk the streets of Manhattan, and I could see something, and I could see signs that, you know, something's for sale, and, and I can't do that anymore. Now, a lot of that, it started with The Art of the Deal with, when that became the number one right. book. And then it, it went to The Apprentice even more so when The Apprentice became so successful. But I can't, it's very hard to do that mm -hmm. now. But uh, I will tell you, I just have a great time with my life. I have a lot of incredible friends, including you. And it was a great honor to be asked well, by you. And I don't know how many people, you know, this is one of the truly great men and great success stories. And it's an honor to be well, up here with you. My pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Let me Thank give you, you a gift. Thank you very much. Let me give you a gift. Thank you. Wow, this is a, this, the first map of the District of Columbia. Thank you. I'm a model of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. State or right. Well, I majored in finance, and I liked finance. Uh, but I, I did, uh, I did well, and I loved the Wharton School of Finance. I always thought it was a great school. But I read that at one point you thought about going into the film business. True. And what took you away from that? Well, it's sort of an interesting story. But uh, I went to, uh, I actually applied to USC, where they had a great school of cinema. They said that was like the Wharton School of Cinema. And I applied. And what happened was a little interesting. There was a man who was having troubles in real estate. And he came to me, smart guy. And he said, could you help me? And I gave him, and I was only 19 years old. And I gave him a lot of advice. And this guy was a top Broadway producer. And I said, you know, I'd love to go to USC and all this stuff. I kept talking about movies. And he said, you know, I tell you what, you just saved my life. You really know real estate. You've got to be crazy to go into show business. And it really affected me. And I went in with my father. And I was uh, in Brooklyn for five years, my first five years. Went into the business with my father. Did some really, really good deals for him. He was very, very happy with me. And he was a tough guy. He was very tough and had a great heart. He was a, a good man, but he was a tough man. And he would never let anybody sign checks, as an example. Under any, so he had to sign every check. You know, today they sign them by computer. I don't know about your company, I'm sure your company. But today you press a button and everybody gets paid. There's no negotiation. Whatever it is, if it's a mistake, they never right. find it. He would sign every single check and he'd look and he'd study it and, oh, and he'd call the people, you're getting too much money, you shouldn't be getting, this is a little different than we have today. So uh, I, I actually continue that practice. I sign many, many, many what? checks. You know, the company's gotten so big it's hard, but I like signing checks because I see what's going on much better by doing that. Right. So what was it like? You go to your father, who you know was a tough guy to work for, and you said, Dad, I want to go on my own. What did he say? He, um, he really respected it. You know, he, as being in Brooklyn and Queens, and we'd look across the river, the East River, and I'd see those big, tall buildings. I'd say, Pop. That's what I want to do. I want to build those buildings. I want to be there. I love it. I got to be there. And he sort of said, that's not our territory. You know, like a lot of fathers would say. He said, you don't know anything about that. And that's not our territory. Let's stay in Brooklyn. 
And you know, my father started off building one-family homes and then apartments for mostly middle-income apartments, almost all middle-income and some low-income using federal subsidies, the uh, 236 program, uh, a lot of different programs. Uh, Section 8, we had a Section 8 program, which was amazing. They gave you the money for nothing. I mean, it was actually a pretty good program for the developer. But it also allowed people to live at a very low rent. And my father did a lot of that, and I did it with him. And we did it well. But I said, you know, Pop, I want to go in. And I started with the Grand Hyatt Hotel. I took an option. And I converted that to the Grand. It, the, it, it was originally the old Commodore Hotel. Sort of interesting how my life progresses, where we go from that to the right, OPO. But, but make sure everybody understands, you were about 29 years old, or something like that, 28, yeah. 29. And you bought an old hotel that was near the Grand Central Station called the Commodore. Correct. And you put in no money. Is that I right? put in almost no money, Almost yes. no money. So how did you manage to do that with no money? Well, it was owned by the Penn Central Railroad, and it was run by some very good people. Uh, actually, it's very interesting, because he happens to be a very good man. It was Victor Palmieri and company, and one of the people is John Koskinen. Does anyone know John Koskinen? He's the head of the IRS, mm -hmm. and he's a very good man. And while I am a strong conservative and a strong Republican, He's a friend of mine, and he did a great job running Victor Palmieri. And I made deals with John and the people at Victor Palmieri and took options to the building. And after I took options to the comic, there's so many things that I see in this country, whether it's common sense or whatever. And I have, I have a big voice. I have you know, millions and millions of followers on Twitter and Facebook. And when I say something, people, some people don't like it, but most people do like it. And whether it's uh, jobs, and the thing I like best, and I think the thing that I'm best at, is the economy, and how to put people to work. Right. And that's what we need in this country. Right. The campaign is typically a two-year process. Right. And then um, you, if you're elected president, you have to spend four or eight years at it, right in the peak of your earning period. You would say that's OK? Well, I have a, a great company with tremendously talented people. I have some of those people sitting right here at the table, some of my executives. But I also have children. I have three of my five children are in the company, Don, Eric, and Ivanka. And uh, they've done a, a fantastic job. And four years ago, I was leading in the polls. I was beating everybody in the polls. And what happened is I just really was loving what I do. I love what I do. I would rather do what I'm doing than run for president. But I also love the country more, and I just think that uh, unless I see somebody that's outstanding, I would very much be inclined to do it. Okay. All right. Well, I don't think you can make any more news than you just made, so. Uh... <laughs> All right, let's go home, folks. All right. So let's start back at the beginning, if we could. All right. Your father was a pretty prominent uh, real estate developer in, uh, not in Manhattan, but in, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn and Queens. Queens. Yes. So um, as a young boy, you would say you were aggressive, maybe, and you were sent to a military academy? I was. I was sent to military academy. Uh, my father said, you know, you need a little discipline. You're sort of tough to handle. And they sent me up to a military academy, New York Military Academy, where we had some really tough people working up there. And, you know, I, I was supposed to be a very smart person, but I was on the aggressive side. And uh, they were terrific. These were drill sergeants. We had one uh, major Tobias, used to be Sergeant Tobias at the time. He got promoted over the years to major, and now he's actually a colonel, and he's very old, but he's a great guy. And he was tough. And you didn't talk back to him. Today, you couldn't do this, OK? This right. was a different world. But you just didn't talk back to this guy, or it was bad, bad trouble. And I mean, today they call it harassment. It would be the biggest front page of every newspaper. But it was, uh, it was a good place, and it was a tough place. And I ended up graduating at the highest rank. So I acclimated. You know, you have to acclimate. You have a, a climate. And it wasn't my climate. But by the time I was there five years, and by the time I finished, I graduated at the highest rank. And I learned a lot about leadership, and I learned a lot about a lot of things. And so you were an athlete. You, you were a captain of the baseball team. And I was. Did yes. you ever think about being a professional baseball player? Well, I always uh, was somebody that loved sports, and I always did well at sports. And I loved baseball in particular. I was on the football team, and I was on the wrestling team. Not a great wrestler. Uh, not a great basketball player. I had bad jumping ability. I just was not able to get up there. But I was a very good baseball player, and. Uh, I, I guess I always did think, you know, right. I was recruited and they all wanted me to go in Major League. And I was a little different today. Those days you'd make $3. You didn't, there was no money, no anything. 
And ultimately, uh, my father had a, a business in Brooklyn, mostly in Brooklyn, New York, and as a real estate developer. And ultimately, I did that for a lot of the right reasons, and it became a lot of fun. I wanted to make it more exciting, and you know, I always loved show business, right. and I loved other things, but I think we put some show business into the real estate well, business. Well, you went to Wharton after New York Military Academy, right. and you did pretty well there, majored in real estate. So we're very pleased this evening to have as our special guest Donald Trump. Um, as you all know, I usually go through elaborate introductions because I've memorized them and figure I should basically show everybody that I've actually done the research. Uh, in this case, I don't really know that uh, he needs as great an introduction as some of the uh, guests that I have given introduction to. I think it's fair to say he's one of the best known business developers, businessmen, real estate developers, entrepreneurs, celebrities, TV hosts, golf promoters and developers and all around well-known uh, person in the United States. And um, I thought uh, that it would be very interesting for everybody to hear from Donald Trump. So I wanted to thank you, Donald, for coming this evening. Well, it's my honor. Thank you very much. Great honor. So let me start by asking you this. And it's rumored that you are thinking of going to Iowa soon to maybe do some exploratory work, and I, my question is, why would you consider a job that has a smaller home and an older plane than you currently have? Why That's would a you very tough question and a very good question. Well, first of all, David called me. He said, would you do this? When David calls, I say yes. When other people call, maybe <laughs> well, not so much. You. But it's a great honor to be here tonight, I must say, and it's an amazing group. So many friends. One of them is David Bossi, who right now is uh, heading up that dinner and he uh, and that whole weekend, and he said in Iowa. Uh, in Iowa, and he said, "Would you do it?" And I have great respect for David and what he's done and what he represents, and so I agreed to do it. And it's going to be a great event. Like this is your biggest sellout crowd. I think we're going to have the biggest sellout crowd that they've ever had in Iowa too, from what I'm understanding. So uh, I look forward to that. But I'm actually also going the night before. There's a real estate dinner in Iowa. Right done by a very, very big company and a terrific company, and they asked me to be the keynote speaker. So I'm there for two reasons, real estate and politics. Okay, so, but um, let me finish that up. Are you considering maybe getting into politics as a candidate, running for president, or you're not sure yet? Well, you know, I've been building buildings all my life. We've done, you know, done a great job, as you understand. And, uh, and one thing about David, if he didn't think we did a good job, I wouldn't be here tonight, that I can tell you. But we've done a good job, and I am considering it very strongly. Uh, a lot of people think that I have fun with it, that I'm playing games, that I enjoy the process. And I do enjoy the process to a certain extent. But the country's in serious, serious trouble. We just, as you know, we just broke $18 trillion in debt, largely to different places like China and others. And we just are in very, very serious trouble. So I am considering it very strongly. Wow. So when do you think you might make a decision? Sometime after the beginning of the year, probably sometime in March, April, or May. Okay. So um, you wouldn't start below the top job. The president's the top job. You wouldn't start a little bit lower, no? Governor or something, just to get a little experience well, in the governor? You know, I've dealt in politics all my life. All of my life I've been in politics, and usually as a supporter on the other side, right. and I support a lot of different people, and people that I think are going to be good I'm a Republican, but I'll support people that I really think are going to be good. And frankly, I just think we need something uh, very good, very fast, or we're going to be in very big trouble as a country. And a lot of it's common sense. For instance, the torture report. Do we have to announce the torture report? Which, by the way, costs $40 million to do. I'm trying to figure out how does this report cost $40 million. They paid these couple of guys $40 million. They paid $80 million to come up with the process. And the so much job of the New York Times gave it phenomenal reviews. And what I did is I just, it just morphed into other things. And then I ended up doing a book, The Art of the Deal, and that became well, such a great well, thing. Well, that building, though, you live at the top is I do. A tri triplex. Top three floors. Yes. Right? You're, now, a lot of uh, wealthy uh, people are being sought after to buy buildings in New York, apartment buildings. Do you think all these, are there enough billionaires to fill all these big buildings that are being built in New York? No, I don't think they'll fill them. And That's your second big story tonight. All right. I so don't like, think you're going to fill them. No, there are too many being built. 432 Park Avenue, you've seen this one, it's like 90 well, stories. Well, and something. they're friends of mine doing it. And, and don't forget, they have the advantage that it was early, early on. 
and uh, they're very good people. And I think, I think that it's going to do okay because it's early. But the ones coming online, I mean, there's so many of them. I look at the plans. I study real estate. I know every inch of Manhattan. I mean, I know which store is available five years before the lease comes due. And uh, I look at all of the plans for Manhattan, and I just don't see any way. I mean, Rush has been taken out of it over right. the last year, you know, as you know. Russia's gone, and a lot of the Russians that were buying these apartments are no longer buying apartments, and they've got bigger problems. And frankly, uh, you know, I just don't see any way they're going to do it. Now, that's an opportunity for you, and it's an opportunity right. for me. A man came to my office. I won't use his name, but he's a very well-known, very big developer. He has a site to build a 100-story building on the site. And I don't love the site, but it's good. Not great, but it's good. You know, the great always works. The good doesn't always work, OK, in real estate. And uh, he has a 90-story building, a 100-story building. You could do sort of whatever you want. And he wanted to sell it to me. And you know, I've been through uh, great, great times. But I've also had to fight like crazy to keep everything going. And I said, you know, you do it. Because I don't have the guts anymore to do it. And he said, I promise I won't tell anybody you said that. Though. Nobody's going to. But it's true. I, I see uh, the market is, I think, will be oversaturated. Well, let me ask you, when you were having this success, you're building Trump Tower, you're doing other things, um, you bought an airline, uh, uh, the shuttle, and then you got involved in, in gaming in right. Los, uh, in, uh, I guess, in Atlantic City. Atlantic City. And then the economy collapsed, and many people thought you were not going to be able to survive. How did you manage to hoping. get... Well, well, I... Well, I just wanted to continue to live my lifestyle. I like, you know, planes and everything else. In those days, I wasn't married, so I like planes and beautiful women. I like my lifestyle. I didn't want to lose my lifestyle. So how did you, so how did you get okay, through all so, that? Well, first of all, uh, the shuttle was great because what happened with the shuttle was this was like 57th and 5th. That was the shuttle going to Washington or Boston. In the airline business, that was sort of like the best asset. So I had that. So the banks came, the market had totally crashed, but the banks came to me and people came to me and I made a deal where it was a great deal to sell the shuttle, even in bad times. Uh, I bought the Plaza Hotel. I made an unbelievable deal in selling the Plaza Hotel because it was so, if that hotel, and I've always said it, if that hotel was one block in any direction, I would have died with it. But because it was the Plaza, I made an unbelievable deal in uh, getting out of the Plaza, and I, it just worked out really well. And other things I did were, I, you know, I was telling, actually, David and I were speaking before, and I said, you know, the crazy thing about Atlantic City, I was there during the boom time when it was a monopoly and did phenomenally in Atlantic City. But then Atlantic City changed. A lot of bad decisions. They built a convention center. I fought like hell that they wouldn't do this. They built the convention center in the wrong location. They didn't do the airport properly. Uh, the politicians took over Atlantic City and absolutely destroyed it. But Atlantic City, for me, has been a great experience. And I got out seven years ago and uh, again, made a lot of money, but I do play the bankruptcy laws, not individually, but corporately. And other people do too. Many of your friends that we were talking about, or I then went to the city, because the city was really in deep trouble. I was about 28 years old, and the city was really in trouble. And I said, look, you're going to have to give me tax abatement, otherwise this thing's never going to happen. Then I went to Hyatt. I said, you guys put up all the money, and I'll try and get the approvals. And I got all the approvals, and Hyatt, Jay Pritzker, and the Pritzker family, they put up the money. And we built a hotel. We were 50-50 partners, and it became very, very successful. Then I did the convention center and lots of other jobs. Okay. Well, let's talk about one of the other very famous buildings you did, uh, Trump Tower. Right. How did you get the right to build that piece of land, and how did you finance that? Well, that was uh, owned by a company named Conseco, and uh, originally Genesco. And I guess you know Genesco. It was from Nashville, Tennessee. And Genesco was run by a father and son. It was a public company, and they were fighting like cats and dogs, unlike your children and my children so far. We want to keep it that way, by the way. But they were fighting like cats and dogs. And I was reading about it, because I love reading the financial papers. And at those times, it was exclusively papers. Today, it's a little bit papers and lots of other things. And I saw the trouble that they were having, that Genesco was in deep trouble. And I knew they owned Bond with Teller Department Store. So I called the head of Genesco, and I went to Nashville, Tennessee, where I have a warm spot in my heart for Nashville, because I made an amazing deal there. I took an option to buy the site. And what happened is, as soon as that option was announced, every developer in the world went there trying to buy it. Because even then, it was the best site. You know, 57th and 5th next to Tiffany is the best site. But it was too late, because I already had it signed. And they tried to get out of it, because obviously, they saw it was much more valuable than what I paid. And then I ultimately dealt with a great man named Walter Hoving, who was the head of Tiffany 
and he took Tiffany to great levels. He took Tiffany from trouble to great levels. And I bought the air rights over Tiffany, and I bought the air rights over another place, and a few more air rights, and I ended up with a 68-story building that turned out to be a tremendous success, as you know, right from the beginning, called Trump Tower. And I guess one of the little, when I bought the air rights from Tiffany, I had the right to call it Tiffany Tower. And I went to a friend of mine, a very uh, streetwise guy, Dennis Stein, and I said, Dennis, I have the right to call it Tiffany Tower, but I want to call it Trump Tower. What would you do? He said, when you change your name to Tiffany, call it Tiffany Tower. Uh -huh. So I called it Trump Tower. Even though I had this incredible right, David, I had this incredible right to use the name Tiffany, but I called it Trump Tower, and it was one of the better things so I've if done. Your, if your name had been Rubenstein, you'd think it would have worked as well, Rubenstein Tower. I, 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 I think it might have worked, worked very well. well. Hey, hey so you, you, Michael Bloomberg's done very well, right? But you came up with the idea of putting your name on things and actually making a brand of it. And when did you actually realize that by putting your name on something, you could actually get maybe a higher price for it? Well, a lot of people think it was, they wrote a big article recently, like I had this brilliant strategy of naming and, you know, I, honestly, it was sort of like, just happened. It started with Trump Tower. I did the Grand Hyatt Hotel first in Manhattan. Right. That was my first job. I did the convention center, Jacob Javits Convention Center, took options to the land, got the state to build right. on it and did well with it, and they built the Jacob Javits Convention Center. But, you know, nobody knew that much about me. And then when I did Trump Tower, because, I mean, I never thought at a young age, like 30, I would have the best piece of land in the world. It, you know, it never changes. I mean, that piece of land was the best then, and it's the best now. We signed a lease with Gucci. That's one of the great retail leases ever signed, as you understand. And so I, I never really knew. And then when I called it Trump Tower, a lot of things happened because of the prominence of the location, the success of the building. I was able to get it zoned. And a lot of people said, you'll never be able to get it zoned. You'll never build a tall building. You'll never be allowed to build an old glass, beautiful monolithic building. Ada Louise Huxtable of the New York Times, the critic, the architectural critic, she gave it phenomenal reviews, just phenomenal. And then later on, Herbert Mushi.